Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Elena, and I run events here at the Strand. Before we launch into a Secrets of Publishing panel discussion on breaking into the literary world, I'd like to share a little bit of history about the Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on Fourth Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 95 years, the Strand is a sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Whited. We wanna thank all of you for your support, but our loyal community of book lovers, authors and writers, such as Susan and our panelists, we wouldn't be here today. We are thrilled to have another Secrets of Publishing panel event with Susan Shapiro. Susan, Susan Shapiro is an award-winning professor and an author of many books for family hates, most recently the book Bible. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Susan and her panelists to the stage. I definitely want to thank the Strand Bookstore, uh, Elena, Walker, Tico, Sabir, Nancy Bass for sponsoring um, wonderful book events. And I always tell my students that you have to support the Strand and only buy books from bookstores where you could do events or we won't be able to do events anymore. And um, uh, for my birthday today, I've gathered um, some of my favorite brilliant luminary colleagues to share their wisdom and inspiration. And uh, my shrink told me a long time ago, hang out with people you wanna be. So that's on my birthday. I always try to think of that and uh, and and um, love to do panels. So I'm gonna, in alphabetical order, I'm gonna read bios and then I'm gonna ask questions and I will be checking the Q and A chat and also on my email if there's any specific questions that you guys want me to ask. So Peter Catapano from Staten Island joined the New York Times in 1998 as a copy boy and has edited their opinion section since 2005, where he's developed award-winning online series, The Stone, Home Fires, Fixes, Disability, Migraines, Proof, Anxiety, and Menagerie, where many of my students were first published. I've been honored to work with him and coerced him to do the... Um, uh, the foreword of Byline Bible. He started the New School, edited four Norton anthologies about us, The Stone Reader, Modern Ethics, and 77 Arguments. And his new book is Question Everything. And PW praised its wit and humor, combining brevity with potency to offer bite sized examinations of how to lead a moral life. Dan Lopez, my new editor for a co authored book, American Shield, works at Counterpoise. Counterpoint Press, and he's based in Los Angeles. He's interested in literary and commercial fiction, cultural history, translations, and books that explore his Hispanic, Latino, Latinx experience. He has a BA from University of Florida, where he grew up, and is author of the novel The Show Horse, The Show House, and the short story collection Part the Hauser, Limb the Sea. He's published short, short stories in Storyland, Ducks, Prick of the Spindle, and the anthology with the New Gay Fiction and Nonfiction in LA Review of Books, Time Out New York, The Millions and Lambda Literary. Aisha Pandey grew up as an emigre moving between India, Germany and New Zealand before coming to the New yet the US as she wrote in the foreword to Book Bible. She, she was a senior editor at FSG before founding Aisha Pandey Literary Agency in 2007 where she's published many award-winning best-selling books including books by authors Ibram X. Kindi, Patricia Engel, Danielle Evans, Lisa Coe, and her agency handled my former student Linda Zeldovich's great recent acclaimed nonfiction book, The Other Dark Matter. She's on the board of Art, Omni, and AALA, where she founded the Committee on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She loves literary fiction, narrative nonfiction, history, cultural commentary, memoir, biography, and her greatest joy is launching new literary voices. Um, now, I have three brilliant former students who I'm gonna introduce, uh, Joy Peskin as Vice President and Executive Editorial Director of S FSG Books for Young Readers. Joy published books by my former student, Abby Sharon, Christine Weidman's upcoming debut, Jawbreaker, as well as bestsellers, Brandon Stanton, Rachel Bright, and Ava Delaria uh, before working at Viking Books, uh, before working at FSG. She was at Viking Children's Books. Her favorite type of books are contemporary, literary, realistic stories about real people facing challenges. She lives with her family in New Jersey, and she's written for Salon, Parenting Magazine, Lilith, and Publishers Weekly. Kenan Trebinsevic is my co-author from The Bosnia List, A Memoir of War, Exile, and Return, and the novel World in Between about being a Bosnian Muslim survivor of ethnic cleansing in the Balkan where who Balkan War, who was exiled to America in 1993. He's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Salon, Slate, Newsday, Esquire Magazine, the International Herald Tribune, and Best American Travel Writing. He works as a physical therapist at Columbia University Hospital and lives in Greenwich Village with his wife and baby son. 
New School alum Renee Watson, who grew up in Portland and now lives in New York, is a number one New York Times bestselling author, educator, and community activist. Her books have sold over 1 million copies. Her YA novel, Piecing Me Together, received a Coretta Scott King Award and Newbery Honor. Her YA books include Love is a Revolution, This Side of Home, and Watch Us Rise. Her MG novels include Ways to Make Sunshine and Ways to Grow Love, Some Places More Than Others, Before uh, Betty Before X and What Mama Left Me. Her picture book, Harlem's Little Blackboard, won a, an NWACP Image Award nomination in children's literature and her co-authored picture book, The 1969 Project, Born on Water, was NPRPW and Time Magazine's best children's book of 2021. And Kirk has called it a gift to Black Americans and everyone else who reads it. Her new picture book about Maya Angelou Maya song was just named a notable 2023 poetry book by the National Council of Teachers. So thank you so much for, um, for everybody coming. Um, since a lot of people come to me, and I think a lot of students are here, and they sort of don't know where to start, I like to start with short pieces, because I always say to my students, even if you have a book idea, it's a million times easier to write and publish three pages than it is 300 pages. So we'll start with Peter Catapano. Um, you've published many of my students um, in, at the New York Times op-ed page and in the verticals that you guys used to do. So Peter, could you talk about if somebody, I know it's much harder lately to get in, to the opinionator section or the the what they call um, uh, guest essays. If someone were to um, attempt to submit a piece to you, could you tell us how to do it? So they're usually around a thousand words. Um, I, I think in, in terms of um, the kind of uh, writing, uh, you know, creative and and uh, beginning writers like to do, they usually involve a, a personal story somehow combined with a a news event or, uh, you know, based on something in the news. Um, and the format does usually resemble a regular op-ed submission, which would be, you know, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 words. But we're not really um, strict about the length. Um, a lot of pitches I get, uh, pieces I get, you know, run about the 1,200 word mark. Uh, really depends on the editor and the topic and how much you know, the writer has to uh, deliver in the piece and how much of it is a, a personal narrative and how much of, of it is a straight op-ed. Um, you know, it needs to be concisely written. Uh, you uh, emphasize this a lot, and it's very true that um, uh, whoever submits to a publication, including the Times or any other publication, should be really familiar with um, the style, the content, the length, the kind of, um, you know, tone that usually... Uh, uh, that that goes on in the section. So a little bit of that homework and maybe picking a few models for yourself if you find pieces in the paper that you like um, to try to use them as maybe templates to to um, decide on length and decide on tone. Great. And um, Ken and I remember when I told you that um, uh, the first assignment I used to give my students is write about your most humiliating secret. You laughed and you said, you Americans, why the hell would anyone do that? And I said, because they want to get published in the New York Times and do books. And then you got published in the New York Times and actually quite a few other um, short pieces before you launched your book. So could you talk a little bit about, um, is there any, how did you, how did you just start breaking into newspapers and magazines? And did that make you feel more confident to keep going with the books? As you know, I have like zero platform because I come from a medical background. So I had to build a resume. So <clears throat> luckily, you know, first time luck, I 900 words uh, were published in New York Times Magazine. And then I had a, a, an editor and an agent reaching out to me asking if I had a book in mind. I remember after that, I wanted to continue writing, but I, I didn't know about the style. So of course, you know, you taught me everything from A to Z, but what maybe other, um, pieces publishable was they were timely. So I remember the second piece, uh, there were like 17 tries, uh, there were like 17 drafts that I, or 17 times I've sent it out and they're, they're all no's. And he said to me, something has to be timely. Something has to be timely. I said, there's nothing timely. Nobody likes this you know, topic. And I remember uh, in April of uh, 2011, I remember telling you that this week is 20th anniversary of, of the war. And she said, oh my, you said, oh my God, like write that in. So just by having that one sentence in the beginning of the piece, um, end up being in the New York Times op-ed. And after that, and those two pieces, I had another editor reaching out to me asking if I had fourth book in mind, meeting, meeting a um, agent at your uh, book seminar. 
you know, he reached out to me and said, okay, well, you know, do you have a book in mind? And I said, well, I don't have a book in mind. I've never written a book before. So that's when I suggest to um, students, writers, uh, to uh, join writing groups, seminars when you meet a, uh, agents and editors, writing groups, you learn how to write, you learn how to get critiqued. And um, in your case, obviously I had you as a co-author. So maybe if you don't have a good background in writing at all, you, you find a co-author, others use ghost editors. Uh, so those are the ways that we broke into um, that I broke into writing world because I had no platform. So what made the book also possible is all these short pieces were extrapolated into chapters. So that's how we structured the book. Cool. And um, yeah, aside from taking my class, I remember that um, Renee, if you don't mind me um, repeating something you said at another panel, um, you had a great story. I think about meeting your book editor in a class, uh, a writing for kids class. Would you mind telling us about that? Sure. And again, happy birthday. And thank, thank you, you for having me. Um, I was taking classes at the new school. And um, one of my courses was on writing about serious topics in children's literature. So we had to come up with a topic that might have a, a young person in maybe therapy or counseling or working through something hard. And I had just returned from New Orleans after working with um, children who had survived Hurricane Katrina. So I wrote about them and their stories. I had done art therapy and, and writing therapy workshops with them. And so my professor uh, kept me after class, which we all know does not often happen in college. And so I was like, why are you asking me to stay after class? And I kind of had an attitude and um, a peer of mine who had, we had been in the class at least six weeks by now. So she knew my work and she's kind of staying behind, slowly putting her things away. And I'm thinking she's being nosy, but it turns out she was an <laughs> editor at Random House. And so both of them were saying, you know, uh, you should send that out. What you wrote, what you got critiqued tonight is really strong. And that that woman who I did not know was an editor said, yes, uh, I work at Random House. I didn't want any of you to know because I didn't want you sending me things, but I do, I see something in you. And so I always say, be your best self all you know as much as you can I had worked on that homework assignment several drafts before I even brought it to class and I was just being um consistent and in in that moment of being consistent an opportunity showed up so I encourage writers to do the work just write when no one's paying attention when you don't have a big deal perfect the craft and then you will find opportunities um to get your voice out there fantastic and joy if you don't mind me mentioning um I was pleasantly surprised that my student Christina Wyman did a short piece of the humiliation essay piece for the Washington Post, and you wound up buying it for a kid's book. And I was so excited about that. So does that happen? Do you think where editors and agents will see one piece and um, get interested and contact the author? I really like to work in what I call this proactive model, where I really like to find stories out there in the world and then reach out to folks who maybe haven't written for youth before or haven't come from different types of creative background and then just ask if they're interested in writing a story for young people many more times than you would think people have wanted to and I think maybe that comes through in the work even though Christina's piece was about being an adult at woman at the start of the pandemic and feeling comfort wearing the mask because it hid her face. And she talks about in that piece, going to the grocery store and feeling as confident as she'd ever felt out in public because she had a craniofacial anomaly. She was born with a really severe overbite. And even though she was aware as an adult that she looked not, not, not hugely atypical, I really related to that piece, to having a similar experience myself, having a mild craniofacial anomaly and also finding comfort in the mask. So I really connected with it. And I thought, Maybe she could do a piece about when she was young and her anomaly was more um, pronounced. And it turned out I reached out to her, you know, through you and she had wanted to write middle grade and we just signed up a second book from her. So it was really fortuitous. And also, I know you've worked with my former student, Abby Sharon. I think she started writing short pieces also. She had a modern love. So so um, so that seems like it's if you want to if you have some book ideas, that might be a good place to start. Right. It's definitely a great place to start if you want to work with me, because <laughs> I love finding stuff out there like that. And I'm sure other editors do. And I'm sure also it's a way to get noticed by agents. I mean, I would recommend it to any writer looking to try to write, because for all the reasons that you talk about in your workshops and panels, you can come to the attention of editors or agents or just, and I learned this too from one of your students I met in your class, Jackie Carubo, gave me this great um, phrase that I think of a lot. It's just about creating a body of work 
you know, if you go and create a body of work, sort of as Renee says too, you do your best work and something could come of it and you might not know what that is, but if you, be, if you put your best work out there, it can grow. Cool. And Dan, has that happened to you at CounterPoint where you've seen somebody's work in newspapers, magazines, or literary journals, and you've met them and, and talked about a book? Sure. There's all sorts of, I mean, when you're an editor, especially when you're an editor outside of New York, um, and anytime you go near the literary scene, the local literary scene, there's always going to be someone who has something. And, you know, you're aware of people like LA here, that's where I'm at. LA has a pretty robust literary scene. So you're kind of always coming across people that are publishing local things or publishing nationally. Um, and there is, that's a great way. It's a great way to find people. It's a great way to kind of find different voices that are maybe outside of what you've been seeing a lot of, like to always kind of tap into what's around. Um, but I would like to echo what folks have been saying about doing the smaller pieces, reaching out. I personally have always been a big fan of building kind of a resume that way um, to the point that's been brought up that if you can have that kind of that bio, it always helps you when you're approaching, I would assume an agent or definitely an editor when you're like, hey, I've been published here, there, and the other place. Um, maybe you write fiction, but you've written book reviews for, you know, an outlet that people recognize. That's always helpful. Um, it just helps kind of distinguish you and it helps you build that resume and helps you just also improve your craft. Because especially, I find one of the things that's difficult for, especially new writers, is selling their work like the idea of their work in the elevator pitch. And so if you're forced to write short, if you're forced to write to a quick deadline, to a quick turnaround, you kind of hone that skill. Um, and that serves you very well when it comes time to move on to the book project. And did you sell short stories before you were able to publish your novels? Um, yeah, I sold a handful of short stories, I, but I mostly built my resume by writing a lot of book reviews. I wrote book reviews for Time Out New York and various other places for years. Um, and that's kind of how I, well, that was like my entree into, into the publishing world. That's a great one. That was mine too. And I feel like you get such good karma. If yeah. You're <laughs> If you're kind, if you're mean, then I don't think you get it. But uh, <laughs> right. anyway, Aisha, as a literary agent, so are there authors who you've whose work you followed in newspaper, magazines, or literary journals, and then it turned into books? Yes, especially earlier on in my career, um, I, I read a ton of literary journals um, and uh, reached out to those authors. Um, and the other thing, of course, is going around to MFA programs where most students um, start out by um, writing short stories. You know, that's the that's the um, the form that's most frequently workshopped, and um, so most of the work that is available at that time is, are short stories, and that's what I frequently have taken on clients based on. And um, there's some questions in the chat for you. One of them is, um, a couple of people noticed you're not open for submissions. Can we ask you when you might be open for submissions? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm always open to submissions uh, uh, for people that I meet on panels. Okay. That's I don't great. know otherwise what I'm going to be open for submissions again. That's great. And, um, and also somebody wanted to know, does it matter if your literary agent is not in your city? Not at all. And someone also asked if we get one literary agent, is that your agent for life? And and you it, it can be, but it doesn't have to be, right? It doesn't have to be. I mean, we hope so because I mean, we we try to really work with somebody for the duration of their career, but sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. Cool. And now I'd like to ask some real specific questions, if you guys don't mind, um, just in terms of. Um, uh, submitting because I found I had an undergraduate degree from University of Michigan and a graduate degree in creative writing from NYU and nobody ever talked about how to get how to submit or how to get published or how to get paid and it made me crazy and it took me like 10 years to figure it out so I like to be very specific so Peter a lot of my students break into the New York Times and it seems as if perhaps the easiest way if you don't have clips or if you don't really have a platform is to write a full essay and uh, modern love is very popular I know people write a whole 1500 word modern love and they submit it to Dan Jones and and um, Mia Lee and I know for your section it's usually a thousand words I know there's a submittable or you could submit the work to um, uh, to a specific editor um, and it seems as if reading a whole bunch of op-ed pieces might help you and I know we have an ongoing argument, but it seems as if if they're timely or playing off the news that that somehow um, makes it easier, would you say? I think I I, I kind of conceded to you on this point <clears throat> a while ago, probably when I uh, I wrote the introduction to your book. 
Um, I think the point I was trying to make is that um, there are some issues and topics that are timeless and that don't necessarily have to be connected to the news. I was interested to hear uh, uh, Renee and, and, and other folks talk about um, getting the work done on your own without any kind of promise or link to a publication or an editor. Because, um, for instance, if you have a, a life experience or an expertise or a, a particular story and you have it well written out and thought out uh, you know, beforehand, sometimes events will occur and uh, news will happen and arise. And then all of a sudden, like you said, your piece uh, or Kenan was saying like, you know, moments arise and your and, and your work that you've already put a lot of uh, care and attention in uh, to uh, becomes marketable. Um, I also think that, you know, it's an opportunity to separate the idea of, you know, quality and saleability. Uh, uh, publications, especially big ones like competitive ones like the Times reject good work all the time because of they don't need it or 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 they they have too many submissions. Um, so making the work good ahead of time and then looking for opportunities to kind of maybe make that turn into uh, a newspaper or a magazine setting, I think is a pretty good strategy. Good. And Kenan, you actually told me um, a lot of benefits of doing short pieces that you didn't expect, including, I think you said one piece, an agent got interested and you were asked to do a film. Yeah, so yeah. I it was like NPR as a radio interview. And, uh, and the best American travel section, I, uh, uh, best American uh, travel book. And also, didn't you tell me that it wound up helping you structure the Bosnia list after you'd written a bunch of short pieces? Yeah, because it gave the book a certain order. Uh, those pieces were extra extrapolated to like chapters. And we had our chapters alternate through time. So be telling me you're not, you know, President Obama or Clinton, you don't get to tell the story from birth till, till you know, Till death, you have to we have to tell a story a different way. So that's how we end up structuring the book. But I was just surprised the fact that people were interested in the topic, and that's what made me write about more. In the beginning, I didn't have um, wish or hope that it would be that it would turn into a book. Uh, but I had an interest in teaching people about the topic. And um, what it helped me the most is give others a voice, and that's how I ended up getting my name out there through our Facebook. People kept. Uh, kept reaching out to me. They were long lost friends. Some relatives I never knew uh, reached out to me. I found writing for us to be very healing and also like helping others. So, and if you don't mind, could you tell us about the um, the Newsday piece? In fact, I think uh, Joy was the one who um, yeah. mentioned. So the the second book started with an essay in Newsweek in, in 2016 um, about the Muslim travel ban of in a certain countries. I remember uh, Joe Peskin so on your Facebook page, and she said, well, since I was 12 years old, when I was exiled to America, this would make a great middle book, uh, middle grade book to teach Americans how to be nice and kind to immigrants, uh, not to be fearful, fearful of foreigners, and also to teach Americans how to help others assimilate. So I remember you saying oh, this could be a Jewish Muslim book of healing about Christians that saved my family. So it kind of all came together. And it took about what, five, four or five years um put together especially the pandemic of course played uh, played a role here because everything slowed down yeah well, and we, let's talk about that about which kind of books you have to do a proposal in which you write the whole thing so renee um when you're doing when you were doing at the beginning especially when you were doing picture books ya and um mg books since they were novels did you have to write the whole manuscript at the beginning yes for fiction you you almost always have to write uh, the full book. And um, a lot of times for me, I would write the book, you know, it would get published. And then like in your contract, you have kind of this agreement where that publisher is saying to you, and we want your next book. So you have, um, you can grow into a relationship with your editor if you stay with the same house that you don't have to write the whole thing, but you have to have a very solid pitch for your next work. So at this point in my career, I am at a point where we can talk about what I want to write. I might do a few sample chapters so she can get the voice and then we go from there. But in the very beginning, I was writing the full um, novel or picture book at, before I would submit it. And if you don't mind, I, I like to get specific because I, I was surprised that there's some picture books that are like 700 words. 
Yeah. So, yeah. So that surprised me. But then I was also surprised, I think, with um, with your middle grade, that a middle grade book could be like 300 pages. And I guess, and that the ages are middle grade is the ages from eight to 12, right? Well, you, I think of it as um, the, the grades of school. So your picture books are usually, I write older picture books, but, but second grade through fifth grade picture book, depending on how wordy it is or what the topic is, middle school is literally middle grade. So sixth grade through eighth grade, and then high school is YA. Of course, a lot of readers read up. So eighth graders want to be reading about high schoolers. So oftentimes they are already reading YA, but normally I'm thinking of middle grade as books for middle schoolers or fifth graders who are reading at a higher level and are interested in, in topics beyond um, some of the early chapter books that they've been reading. And how did you know how to just, um, you know, write a picture book? Well, I know you took a class for that one, but like, um, uh, what mama left me for your middle grade or your YA books. Did you read a whole bunch of, of books in that genre before yes. you, could you talk about that? Yeah, I, yeah sure. I did both. I think it's, it's yes. And uh, I read a lot. I think I say this to writers all the time, especially uh, writers of children's literature. You cannot write well if you don't read well. And I don't mean read well, like read fast or uh, even read diversely as far as different genres, but read the thing you write. If you're writing realistic fiction, you should be reading a lot of realistic fiction so you can see what other authors are doing, what's out there, who do you kind of fit with. Um, I always say, if you love a book, read it again and figure out why you love it so much. What is that author doing to make you turn that page and get to the end? And then aspire, like figure out how you can um, use their work to inspire yours. And so, yeah, I, I read a lot and I also took courses. So I went back to school in my late twenties to finish my degree. And I took a lot of writing courses as I was getting um, drama therapy certification. I just also picked up several writing classes and I really study books. Um, I'm not um, precious with books. I marked them up and and get all it into it. And for picture books, I said, I remember sitting and literally counting the words because like you, I was like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know like how many words should be in this picture book. So I have, I have um, dissected books so that I can understand how they're made and, and try to replicate that in my work. Yeah, fantastic advice. Great. Now, Aisha, if somebody wants to work with you as a literary agent, should they have, if it's fiction, should they have completed an entire novel or short story collection? And if it's nonfiction, a, a completed proposal, or is it ever appropriate for an author to try to contact an agent before they have a completed project? If they are a debut author of fiction, then it's almost always preferable to have the entire um, manuscript done. Um, I have taken on clients based on a partial, but um, that was mostly in a sort of like competitive situation where, you know, the where there were several other um, agents who were also interested. And in the case of nonfiction, if not um, a, an entire proposal, at least you know, some important elements of the proposal, like, like the overview and maybe the chapter outline and some sample material. Do you have a specific way that people contact you? Like some agents say through submittable, put in the first 10 pages of your book or something like that. Are you specific like that? I mean, we, we do have a form on our website through which, you know, people should um, query me, um, except uh, when I meet them through you and they can just contact me on, on email. Cool. And Dan, when you're open for new books, do you also feel that if it's fiction, somebody should have, a, you know, the entire manuscript should be complete, whereas most nonfiction books um, might be able to be sold on proposal? Sure. Uh, it's very rare when I would look at fiction that is not complete because you want to feel the story. If you if you like it and you're drawn into the story, you don't want to be like left hanging. You want to make sure that the author can you know land the plane um, or at least that you can see where they're going and you can help them to get there. Uh, for nonfiction, nonfiction is more interesting. Like I've seen 20 page proposals. I've seen 150 page proposals. Um, so it's hard for me to say like, oh, it must be this line length and do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, for me personally, it's like, is the story interesting? Do I get a sense that the author 
has a solid idea of the story they want to tell. Um, if it's deeply reported nonfiction, have they done some of that reporting or can they lay out for me how they're going to do it? And I have confidence if they have previous books, that's helpful because you can be like, okay, maybe I've read some of them or maybe I can research them and see to fill in the gaps of what's not in the proposal. Um, but for sure, for fiction, you want to see as much of it as possible. Um, and it's a lot on taste. I saw a question in the chat in here about kind of how much you read and how much you get into it before you kind of make a decision. So I kind of wanted to address that as well, that when you're reading something, we always try to give it as much, and I imagine this is true of all my colleagues here, that you always try to give it as much time as you can um, with the understanding that there's a lot coming in all the time. Um, but it is really important to kind of hook the reader, in this case, the editor, very early on um, and give a sense with fiction, especially give a sense of like, okay, here's the voice, here's the pacing, here's how, you know, you can put it into a world with other books. Like there's always that exception that's like a unique one of a kind book that we all fall in love with. Um, but the way the business works, you're going to be comping into something else to help you put it out in the marketplace and to bring readers to it, get publicity, do all that stuff. Um, so anything the author can kind of do to structure your reading experience is how I put it when you're going in, like as an editor with limited amount of time, you want to be able to like jump in and have everything you need. So you can start reading and be like, if I fall in love with it, can I kind of start building the case for it right away? Um, there's also been an interesting debate lately with memoir as to whether somebody needs to complete a whole memoir or whether memoir could be sold on proposal. Does it just depend on the project and the, um, I mean, so for example, with American Shield, which we sold a counterpoint that was sold on a proposal, but I think it was partly because uh, my co-author um, Equilino Ganell had such a huge platform because he was mm -hmm. on CNN every night um, talking about the January 6th hearing and what happened to him. Um, but then I've heard Dan say, usually if it's somebody that's debuting, they want you, they'd like to see a whole memoir before making a decision. So does it just depend on the project? It really does. Um, I mean, Ganell is a good example of someone like that is, that's the platform. That's a story that's like historically important. You put together a good proposal with him. So like all that helped make it, make the case for buying it more, how think of it, thinking about acquiring that book more as one would think about acquiring like a sort of nonfiction project. Um, traditionally, I would say for memoir, at least for me, I want to be able to read the whole thing. So unless it's like some really buzzy, you know, news thing, some other thing that is like bringing the energy to the book. Um, yeah, you want to be able to read the whole thing because memoir is one of those tricky genres where people that love memoir and people that hate memoir. Um, so it's always a little bit of like, well, how are we going to market this? So you want to make sure that the writing is what you fall in love with, you know, like a lot of, I think as us editors are looking for something we fall in love with. So unless you have like a big media reason why maybe that's a little less important and the story is more important or something like that, you're going to want to make sure you have like the whole experience as you're reading the memoir for me. Cool. Now, Joy, I don't know that much about kids books, but I do know that I've had students who've sold picture books and I was actually interested to hear that editors did not want them to work with illustrators unless they were an illustrator themselves. And then when it came to middle grade, I was actually surprised. You might've been the one that told me that, that there are middle grade and YA nonfiction books that can be sold on proposal, even though most YA and MG debuts in fiction have to be complete. So is that is that your experience? Like, will you are you more likely to buy a nonfiction YA or MG book based on a proposal and not the entire manuscript first? All of the things that you said are true. Picture books definitely, definitely, definitely do not get your niece's boyfriend or what have you to illustrate it because they're kind of good at art. Once you see bad art, it's impossible to unsee it. Um, so <laughs> just right. The manuscript, we will pair it with an illustrator and we will never pick somebody that you don't like. Um, we'll work closely with you if we buy the manuscript to find an illustrator whose work fits your vision for the text. Um, in terms of nonfiction, I do, I have been leaning more into narrative nonfiction, YA and middle grade, question mark, maybe recently, but definitely YA. And I have always bought narrative nonfiction, YA on proposal. Sometimes I bought it on, um, you know, based on seeing an essay with this book, actually, I have it, the 57 bus, I bought this because I read the um, 
piece in the New York Times Magazine about the fire on the 57 bus, which was an incident that happened in 2014, where one youth set the skirt of another youth on fire on the 57 bus in Northern California. And it was just extremely serendipitous because the writer of that piece was also an author that I work with on picture books. She just had a very wide range of ability and she happened to be an award-winning journalist as well. So I read the piece and then I realized it was her and then I had a relationship already with her agent and I reached out to the agent to say, I think this could be a whole book. And Dashka Slater, the author, had wanted it to be a full book as well. And that's how that happened. And so Dashka's second book with me, Narrative Nonfiction Accountable, is coming out this year. And I did buy it on the idea. And really, it was because I knew Dashka and trusted her process and our ability to work together. And other narrative nonfiction YA I can think of, I also bought on proposal. But there has to be a lot of trust. In that case, the author really has to have a lot of, for, for me to buy it, a lot of journalistic expertise and experience. I have to really trust that they have a vision for the story, that they know how to report it, and that they can they can do what they're aiming to do and that we can figure it out together. So yes, I will do that. And I know, I know in Book Bible, I talked about the elements of the, the typical elements of a nonfiction proposal, which is an overview, sample pages, chapter breakdowns, bio, publicity. So are kids' book uh, proposals very similar to adult book proposals, do you think? Yeah, it's similar. I think it depends. I mean, there are two types of narrative nonfiction books I've worked on. Something like the 57 bus, where that was an incident that had happened and Dashka had done the full had done a full range of reporting on it and then went back and dug a little bit deeper. So that had played itself out. There's also stories that I think of more like a documentary. And I imagine that when a studio sometimes green lights a documentary, they're intrigued by the setup, but they don't know how it'll happen. For example, I worked with the journalist Jennifer Miller on a book called Rising Class, which is coming out later this year, in which we decided that she would set out to follow a group of first generation students who were the first in their families to go to college through their first year of college. And we would just kind of let the cameras roll. It turned out that was the pandemic year. So we didn't plan that, obviously, um, but it was hugely disruptive to their first year. And luckily they're all on track to graduate anyway, very exciting in the spring of 23, but we didn't know how that was gonna work out. We just wanted to see. Um, so in that case, we couldn't have projected. The idea was just we bought the book. She was going to follow these kids through their first year, and we were going to see how it happened. So in that case, it was just some sample chapters of some initial reporting she had done and her vision for following them through the year. But we couldn't have known what the year would bring. Hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about best writing advice that we could share, because I, I, as I said, I think we have a lot of aspiring authors and, um, and students here. So Peter, I know, I think you have an MFA in fiction from the new school, right? No, I went to Brooklyn College uh, to study <laughs> fiction, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I still have three credits to complete. Um, oh, hilarious! Um, <laughs> so, would you say that um, did the classes it. did the classes help you? Is getting a full time job in publishing because that led to a lot of your books? So, what kind of advice do you would you give to somebody who, um, you know, either would want to write for you or might want to get a job at the New York Times, or do your kind of books? Get a job at the New York Times. I, I don't. I don't actually know how that I, I accomplished that. I, I just worked at the lowest possible level. And what did I, you start as? It was a copy boy. I was a I was a temporary employee. I was a copy boy. Uh, then I was you know a clerk. I, I you know it was like mailroom and phones and all that kind of thing. Um, By the way, I, that, so that's good advice sometimes. Like take even a low level job at the place where you would like to work because that you could, you can move up. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely a, like my whole life I've been like, just get in the room with the person that you, you want to be near. I did it with, you know, musicians. I would go to jazz shows when I was young and I would just wait till everybody left. So I could talk to the, you know, the, the musicians and, you know, same with writers. And then, yeah, I mean, I took, I took these really um, low level jobs at the times because it just seemed like if I hung around enough, um, someone would recognize I could do something else. Uh, it didn't happen so quickly. There was actually a five year break. Um, but like, I think that applies to everything involved with being a writer, including, you know, going to readings, uh, listening to other people read, helping uh, your friends and associates with their work, being able to give feedback. You always call it being a good literary citizen. And um, I'll confess to you right now, I just started doing open mic uh, poetry readings again. 
cool. after you know 25 years of being an editor in at the times because um i i miss that and i want i want that contact and i want that conversation to go on with other people i'm not going to tell you where it is so you don't uh, show up but um yeah so uh i guess is, did i answer the question yeah yeah, yeah put, your, put, put yourself in the place you want to be i'm also a big fan of sneaking in side doors back doors um you know not paying full price all that kind of thing so cool um kenan what kind of advice would you give somebody and and i think you're a perfect example of somebody who you have a full-time job as a physical therapist english isn't your first language you're from bosnia so you have some good you had some good ways i thought that you um you know, you were able to write, but it wasn't, you weren't doing it a hundred hours a week. I think I mentioned before, so joining writing groups, seminars, um, knowing the publication that you want your work to be in, see if anything else has been published uh, about the same topic before, which I would, you know, I found that out, um, you know, by getting, um, you know, a no um, multiple times. But the most important part, I think for me, is not to feel discouraged. Um, be very open to suggestions just because something happened doesn't mean uh it's important you know for that particular piece um and i think if you really want it out there um it's very possible but you want to tell the story that no one uh, no one else has told before so you just have to learn or have someone teach you how to tell it good and um renee what kind of advice i know you've helped a lot of people um of all ages actually get into writing. So what other kind of advice could we share? I always say to aspiring writers, um, stay true to the story that you want to tell. It's not really about writing to trend or trying to figure out what will sell. What will sell is the thing that you write and work on hard and write from your heart and you will find the editor who also wants that story. Um, so, so, so much of my career has been having to fight for the stories I want to tell and to make sure that I'm staying true to my values, right? And so I just want to encourage folks who are out there feeling like I can't get this one thing published. You keep working on it and you will find the person who wants to publish it. Um, I think it's important to know why you are writing and what is driving you so that on those days when it's not working, you still write. I was a writer before I was a published author. Um, and so I think it's important to own that you're a writer, even if you're not published, and keep working on that craft until something breaks for you. So I just want to encourage people to uh, do the hard work when no one is watching so that when people start watching, you're ready. Great. That's terrific. Um, Aisha, what kind of advice do you give people, especially because, um, you know, you have to complete a project usually before you would contact an agent? So, um, so classes... Um, you know, I, I'm writing workshops and stuff like that obviously could help somebody put together to finish a project. Any any other advice that you could give? I would say um, don't rush the process. Um, I, it is le learning how to write is um, a, a very, very difficult craft, just like, you know, playing the violin or dancing ballet and um, it just takes time you know there's many many different facets to really really good writing um, give yourself the, the the time and the space to really really practice the craft and also remember that each different genre whether it's short story writing or fiction or non-fiction is a different craft and so if you're transitioning between those different genres it means that you have to master another way of communicating another way of writing um, and also find a reader that you really, really trust um, that is not related to you in any way, shape or form. Um, ideally, somebody who's, uh, who's um, trained in writing or has been published or has worked in the publishing industry and who, who reads the way that an editor would read a, a, a submission because editors read very, very differently from you know, somebody who's just reading for entertainment. You know, they scrutinize um, the, the prose very carefully. So um, find a reader who is in that world. Great, and Joy, do you have any different um, advice that you can offer? You know, I think 
I have been fortunate to take classes from you. So I speak from experience and, and presumably a lot of folks in this room have, but like, if you don't have a Sue, find a Sue or just take classes from Sue. You need somebody by that. I mean, you need somebody who is really, really, really knows what they're talking about and is going to give you, you know, just as able to jump in there and give you really critical, smart advice about making your work the best they can be, because it doesn't do you any good. As Aisha just said, you can ask your mom to read your work, but your mom loves you and is going to tell you that it's great. You know, you need somebody to tell you what's working, what's not working, where it could live and where it won't live. You know, it doesn't do you any good to sit and write alone without getting that critical feedback. So make sure you have a group or somebody in your life who can give that to you. And then also specifically for me, for writing for young people, you know, for me, you have to have a reason that you want to write for young people. You, and not everybody does. And that's totally fine. Not everybody should or needs to. Um, writing for children is fun. But that is not enough of a reason to do it. You know, those of us who are in this world see it, or I think, or at least I do, as a bit of a calling, as dorky as that sounds. Like, if you write a book for a young person, this might be the first book they read that they really love or the first book that they read that they see, oh, this character or this real person made it through this and I can too. Like, it's really important. There has to be a reason that you're looking to connect with the community of young people and to get to them through gatekeepers like educators and, um, you know, bookstore owners and parents and guardians. You know, there is a drive to connect with that young person that I look for when I look for an author to work with. Great. And Dan, you're both a writer and an editor. Do, does having the double career help you? Because I actually found that by writing by day and teaching by night that it, I actually had good karma or something and it wound up helping me. Do you like, do you like having, doing both? Yeah. And it depends who you talk to. Some people think of it as a liability, um, but uh, no, I have found definitely it's helpful to, if nothing else, you're understanding where the author is coming from. Uh, so when you're working, especially with a debut author, like you've been in that position, you know the questions that they should be asking, and you also know what they're experiencing um, firsthand. And that can be really helpful when you're guiding your author, because this is a very complicated process. If you, you know, get fortunate enough to find the agent, find the publishing house, you know, get the book bought, like all of that, it's still like, it feels very overwhelming. So it's really helpful to be able to empathize with your author and help them out. Um, and in terms from the editor side, uh, you can kind of see all the mistakes you made when you were an author and feel a little better when you're helping your authors. Like, no, 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 I've been there. I put that quote there. I did this. I did that. You don't start this way. You do it this way. Like all those kind of little things that, uh, again, especially with debut authors that um, they're just, they're learning, they're experiencing it uh, with more advanced authors too. Like there's always there's always a nice recipro reciprocity between the editor and the author when you kind of can both understand where each other's coming from. Um, so I've found that it's been really helpful for me to be able to kind of wear both those hats. And is there any other advice you could share to authors who want to publish with CounterPoint, which is um, pretty much the best literary independent? <laughs> yeah, I mean, for sure we are the best. Uh, but yeah, no, it's weird. We're similar. Like, I really liked what Joy said about um, the passion. You want to feel that the author is really committed to the story that the author has like for nonfiction, that they're an expert in this field, um, that they're passionate about this field. And for fiction, I'm always just looking for really great voices. And so people that want to be with CounterPoint, um, I definitely recommend checking out our list. We like all editor, like all publishing houses out there, we have a kind of a vision that can't always necessarily be articulated in like a panel like this. But if you look at kind of the books we publish, you can kind of get a sense of the things we're doing. Um, so definitely do your homework, see the type of books we're publishing, see the type of voices that we're interested in promoting, um, get to know the editor as well that you're interested in submitting to. Like you don't have to be best friends, but follow them on Twitter, you know, do all that kind of stuff. See the kind of things that they're putting out in the world or helping put out in the world so that when you are pitching them, you can position your book um, in a way that will appeal to them. Uh, but yeah, that passion, you want to know, I want to see something that is unique, but also is universal, um, which can sometimes feel like a, like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth at the same time, but you want, you want to feel that spark, that connection, and you want to feel like, oh, wow, this is, this voice has to be published, we have to put it out there. Great. And in terms of advice, I agree with everybody. I think classes can be extremely helpful, especially if you study the genre that you want to write in with a teacher who has published um, or is an agent or editor. 
Um, so I think that's a great idea, writing workshops. Um, I love, uh, Peter mentioned, be a good literary citizen. And Renee, we got that from Jen Baker, uh, talked about that. And to be a good literary citizen, I mean, you guys, if you like the authors here, buy their books, follow on social media, um, help the Strand Bookstore, which is a beautiful independent bookstore. Um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of things you could do to be a good literary citizen, as Dan did, review books or write Q&As of authors you admire. So those are good things. I'll actually add something else that um, that helped me, what a lot of people don't talk about, was even though I took classes and did writing workshops and um, tried to be a good literary citizen, did book reviews, I still was having trouble publishing a book. And I wound up hiring a ghost editor who was an editor, had been an editor at Doubleday for 20 years. And that really made a huge difference. I've been trying to sell a book for seven years. And by working with a, um, a ghost editor who line edited, um, you know, I remember I thought it was ridiculously expensive, but then I got, you know, a big advance from Random House. And, and, and now I swear by ghost editors. And actually, Renee's friend, Jen Baker, is a terrific ghost editor. She's actually helped three or four of my students in a row. So if anybody wants to go that route, if you email me, there are certain people I recommend. And I usually only recommend people who've been agents or book editors because they they know the market so that is one that is you know a secret trick that um that's helped me okay so last question um tell us what's exciting that you have going on now that we should uh that we should check out so peter congratulations on question everything which recently came out from uh norton and i saw you had a, a new interview no new podcast that you did are you still doing events for it um can you tell us a little bit more about uh about that about your new book Sure. So uh, Question Everything uh, came out in uh, late October, early November, and it was uh, uh, basically a collection of essays I edited in the in the Stone series, which was a philosophy series uh, that ran weekly uh, uh, on the Times uh, in the Times opinion section, um, covering like 2015 to 2021. So it was like seven years in the making. And it it, it includes about I guess forty or fifty different authors. Um, I've said this at um, our book party. I always love being involved in anthologies because uh, it's fifty people getting published at once, uh, and you can kind of share the share the joy. And also, I can brag about the book because I didn't write it, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's terrific. So, um, yeah, I'm really still you know I'm doing little events, podcasts, talks when I can to kind of spread the word about it. And, um, you know, also to keep doing work at the times that I enjoy, which is this kind of uh, meeting place between philosophy and commentary and personal narrative that I think is a, a little bit of a form of its own that we won't say we invented, but that I like to work in that style. So always looking for more of those types of pieces. And actually, um, in in uh, Book Bible, I have a whole chapter about anthology. So if somebody, for example, doesn't want to write a whole book or can't, that is an option. It's an interesting option if you have a great idea, um, and you and you have connections to other um, authors. I know people who've debuted with anthologies. So, Ken, and what kind? Of, uh, what do you have going on? So I know World in Between came out during the pandemic, um, but I know that you've done some events for it, um, and you're still doing online events for Bosnia List, right? There's some colleges in the high schools that use Bosnia list in their curriculum. So I had someone from St. Louis, uh, this high school that always, every year they reach out to me and a teacher wants to do another Zoom session. So uh, after the students read the book, we do like a QA. and a <clears throat> And the class is called Bosnia American uh, Studies and St. Louis has about 75,000 Bosnians. So these kids are in high school, so most, mo I mean, all of them were born here. So they take the class to learn about the heritage. So they you know, read the book and they ask all sorts of questions. So. And am I allowed to ask you to, to tell the very happy ending? I always find that students, when they publish books, amazing things happen, but I think Kenan wins the award for the, the most beautiful. So um, can you tell them what happened after Bosnia List got published? And that's how I met my wife. So <clears throat> I, took a, I took a plane to Europe and we met after uh, connecting on, uh, on Facebook after she read um, uh, the book. And I, that was 2018, 17. And I proposed like three weeks later. And then uh, now we live here in Greenwich Village and we have a 15 month old. So, so My favorite parts to it were that he always complained that unfortunately because of the war, he didn't really have very much family in Bosnia. And he had a picture of his son's first birthday with what about a hundred Sarajevan relatives from your wife's yeah. side. Yeah, my husband, my wife is from the capital. so. 
last September 1st, we had a family party and I had no idea how many cousins she had, but there were all these kids uh, his age and also, you know, adults. Are, yeah, Ken, like, um, by, by facing down my past, I found my future. So I love that, 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 that was a, a, an unexpected side effect of, of a book. So Renee, congratulations, you're already uh, winning awards for Maya Angelou's Maya song. So are you still doing events for that? Um, and I noticed you've been traveling a lot or when you do events, do you do them for all your books now? Yeah, it's kind of a combination. It depends on what the invitation is. I'll um, be touring heavily for the book that's currently out or just coming and talking about my work in general. So the latest books are um, Ways to Share Joy, which is the third installment of the Ryan Hart series, a middle grade series. I'm currently writing, like right before I got on this, I was writing and working on the fourth book, uh, which is the last book of the series. And then, yeah, the picture book about Maya Angelou just came out in the fall. Very proud of that book. It's illustrated by Brian Collier and it's told in verse. So it's poetry um, telling the, sto the story of our beloved poet, Maya. Fantastic, congratulations. And Aisha, do you have, what's, what's going on now? Do you have any new books that are coming out that we should go buy? Yes, um, I, the most recent one that I'm so proud of is by my client Matthew Saleses about uh, a Korean American um, bas NBA basketball star loosely based on um, Jeremy Lin, if you all remember, Lin Sanity. Um, that was, you know, such a unique moment in time. And the book is called The Sense of Wonder, and it's getting incredible reviews. Fantastic. And um, and I did you see that New York Review of Book piece on um, Dark Matter? For uh, Oh, my God, that was I couldn't believe that. That was like a 5000 word rave. Former student Nina Zeldovich. That was amazing. And I love how they just take their own time. You know, it, I mean, the, <laughs> the review came really like good. a year after the book came out. But hey, it's just fabulous. So. Yeah, that was amazing. Congratulations. And Joy, I can't wait for um, Christina Wyman's book, Jawbreaker. I promised her she's going to schlep from Michigan and I'll give her the New York book party. Is there anything out that you've just put out now that we should go by? Keep your eye out for Jawbreaker. That's coming out later. Um, further on down the line, and we just signed up a second book from Christina called Slouch, which is coming out about a year after the first year and a half. But keep your eye out. Um, my really important book to me that published in 2022 is called Don't Look Back, um, which I was fortunate to edit. It's by Achute Dang and Keely Hutton. And it is about Achute's experience surviving the Second Sudanese Civil War and then coming to America as a refugee and surviving that experience as well. Fantastic. And you've been publishing some great pieces yourself, uh, Lilith and um, Salon most recently, right? Thank you. Yes. Yes. Congratulations. More to come. Great. Thank you. Dan, Dan Dellis, do you have any new books that we should go look for? Definitely the one that uh, you and Sergeant Gunnell are doing with us that comes out later this year. So keep that, keep an eye out for that. Um, and tomorrow, um, this book that's right there, the Chinese Groove by Catherine Ma comes out. Really excited about that. It's very, it's a buoyant um, immigrant story of a young man who comes to America from China with dreams of being a millionaire poet slash tech entrepreneur. And he lands in San Francisco and finds reality is very different than what he expected. Um, very lighthearted, but also digs into like really relevant questions today of what it means to what the American mean dream means to people today, um, especially in places like San Francisco, they're facing a lot of problems um, due to gentrification, et cetera. So definitely look out for that. That comes out tomorrow. We've been getting um, lots of amazing reviews, a lot of amazing coverage. It actually was covered in the San Francisco Chronicle today. And that is sadly, but also happy, I guess, in a way, their last um, uh, their last original book review. From here on out, they're going to just start running AP reviews. but. So we got the last one for Catherine. She lives there. So that was very nice to see. Wow. Well, and um, so my um, my recent book that came out is the book Bible, How to Sell Your Manuscript No Matter What Genre Without Going Broke or Insane with a brilliant um, forward by Aisha Pande. I have a lot of upcoming classes and um, some of my books are about quitting addiction. So I'm now addicted to email. Thank you, Joy. So if you, if you didn't get your question answered and you want to email me, um, propsu123 at gmail.com. You're allowed to email me. And I want to thank everybody, especially the Strand Bookstore. You guys buy books at the Strand. They also have great tchotchkes and umbrellas and book bags and just amazing books. You could get them all online. So um, thanks to Elena, Walker, Tico, Sabir, and Nancy at the Strand Bookstore. And again, let me thank the panelists 
uh, uh, quickly again, Peter Catapano from the New York Times, Dan Lopez from uh, Counterpoint Books, Aisha Pande from Aisha Pande Literary Agency, uh, Joy Peskin, who's the Vice President and Executive Director at FSG, uh, Bosnia List and War World in Between author Kenan Trebinsevic, and um, number one New York Times bestselling author Renee Watson, whose new book is Maya's Song. And we'll give it back to you, Elena. Yes, I was just going to echo my thanks to all of you and to our audience. Um, I have linked in the chat for some of the books from our panelists that we have available here at the Strand. And thank you so much again, everybody, for coming. Have a great evening. We'll hopefully do this again soon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great to see everybody. Thanks for putting it together for us.